talk, I sound funny. There's a lot of distractions that, that come into the body as you get a little bit older, Pastor Joe. You're going to see one day. You're going to see. <laughs> and man, let me tell you, now I know what they meant. You have to get old enough to have a lot of distractions in the body to really learn how to properly depend on Christ. Then you're ready to go. Then you're ready to go. You, 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 you understand? Because see, the, it's easy to say, oh, pastor, here, look, look, let's, let's, let's pray that God removes this hearing thing here, and let's pray. And all that's fine. All that's fine. But whatever you do, pray that he don't remove anything until his kingdom purposes are established. Amen? Amen. Because let me tell you, if that's what it takes to come in here and feel like, man, I'm not as confident as I usually am because I'm dealing with this, this, and that, and I might be right where you need to be to really depend on Christ. Amen? Amen. So that's where we're at. And that, that's a good place. See, I'm learning. I'm learning. That's a good place to be. I'm learning it's a good place to be. When I had that old hearing all clogged up, had that nagging cough, and that could come off at any second now, right in the middle of some good preaching, you know? Uh, so all these little distractions are actually, until you get a little older, Jaden, you don't realize how much of a blessing these distractions are because they teach you to rely on Christ. Amen. Amen. And there's no better place to be than to rely on Christ. So today... We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit baptism, but probably in a little bit different way. Uh, and uh, Jaden, could you help me with something, brother? Would you would you come out of your your your, your row there, walk over here? This is what a young, good-looking man looks like. But that's not why I'm calling you up, brother. Would you would you grab my water bottle and bring it to me? I, uh, I forgot. I forgot. Hey, actually, I can still catch. Come on, throw it here. I can still catch. There you go. All right. Thank you, brother. I need that. I could pick on him because he's one of my closest friends in my life, and he knows it. I learned a lot from that young man right there. The Holy Spirit baptism, and I'm going to preface it with this uh, statement that uh, came to me in my backyard just walking around my backyard, I got this statement, I mean, clear as the Caribbean. Just sharp, just boom, word for word came to me. And I texted it to a few of, of you out there. It's going to make more sense as we get to the end of the message maybe, but it says, when the life of Christ is absent, Man feels a need to find a spiritual gift or attribute that he is able to do to convince himself that the life of Christ is present in him. This can be deceitful. I'll say it again. It's quite an intro, huh? This is not what they teach you to start services with. When the life of Christ is absent, man feels a need to find a spiritual gift or attribute that he can do to convince himself that the life of Christ is present in him. This can be deceitful. And the reason it can be deceitful is because the spiritual gift or the spiritual attribute or the or the, um, you know, the spiritual disciplines even that we have learned are all good things. They're all from God, and they're very good. But our confidence in them can replace our confidence in Christ. The greatest thing that we can experience is the very life of Christ. And what I mean by that is not a life that begins to look like his, but I mean a life that is his. I mean a yielded vessel, a yielded follower that says, Lord, I am convinced that until you actually live through me, until you live, 
speak, work, act through me. Live, move, have my being in you, Lord. Until there is evidence of your life, not as I demand it, not when I demand it, but at a day and an hour unknown to me that the life of Christ resurrects within me and clearly there's a Christ takeover. Until I see this, Lord, regularly in my life, time to time, from glory to glory. Heard that before? Until I see from glory to glory, may I never take refuge in a spiritual activity that I've been trained to do. You see, it takes every spiritual activity and puts it in the very good category, yet very inferior to the actual life of Christ. You see, we don't rejoice in spiritual activity. We rejoice in the activity of Christ, which makes it very spiritual. You see, what I'm trying to say is that these things are not bad, but settling for them is destructive. When the height of what we're about is when we achieve a certain goal or status that declares us a mature Christian, then we've been deceived. That's so I don't cough in the ears of those on Facebook and YouTube. Do you remember a day when you sought salvation? Like never before. Do you remember that? Do you remember how fervent, how desperate? Do you remember how aware you were that you could add nothing to this equation and that every ounce of it depended on Christ doing something and if Christ didn't do something, nothing would happen. And you knew it. Do you remember how convinced you were of that? I do. Do you remember how you rejoiced And then, now I'm speaking from my experience because the the camp I come from was was very highly charismatic camp. So that's who I'm real familiar with. But I can remember shortly after that, I can remember people that I, I, I still highly respect today and look up to greatly, and I'm very thankful for them. But I can remember the, the emphasis going, now, hey, listen, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And boy, were they right. Boy, were they right. No doubt. And, do, and, and if you're like me, you were, you were told that. And, and, and if you were like me, boy, you eagerly, just like you sought Christ to be born again. That same, do, do, do you remember that, that same intensity came? And boy, we began to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember how, how you were convinced that if he didn't do something, nothing would happen at all? Do you remember how your dependency was on him? Do you remember that? Do you remember the intensity of your dependency? I do. I, I remember that. I remember that. And then for, 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 for many of us, something happened that was crystal clear, not only to you, but to others, that the power of the Holy Spirit came into your life. And you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
But for, 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 many, for many of us, there was an event that took place. There was, there was some outward demonstration that this happened, whether it was speaking in tongues or, uh, you, you know, pro- you began to prophesy. Uh, and then for others, it just, maybe that didn't happen, but, boy, it was crystal clear that there was an empowerment in you and the life of Christ came alive, and, and, and people saw this, and it, it, there was an outward demonstration of that. Do you remember that? Now, a lot of us didn't come from that camp, and, and that's okay, but you can understand what I'm saying. Now, here's, here's the next question. After you sought with that type of intensity, there was an intensity of dependency, and there was an equal inten- intensity of great eagerness and desire for Christ to do something in you, save you, baptize you in fire. <clears throat> he does both. The intensity, see, I'm, I'm just getting these words. It's clearness. It comes from heaven. It's clear. And the word is this. An intensity of dependency and an equal intensity of eagerness. You depended on him as great and as much as you desired him. And let's be honest. Here comes the question. Once you've received those two events, let's be honest. How often, how often did you intensely depend on Christ and intensely desire Christ for anything else? Be honest. Think it through. It's real, huh? That's a sobering question, isn't it? And it's not meant to condemn or convict anybody. That's a sobering question. That for the vast majority of Christians, the intensity of eagerness and dependency that they had the day they were saved And for many others, the day they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, for for, for the vast majority, that eagerness of dependency and intensity of desire has never been experienced again. Friend, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was never intended to decrease your desire for Christ. Do, 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 do you hear that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit was never, it was never God's intention for the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the very salvation of Christ to lessen our intensity and dependency for Him. But yet if we're honest, the sober question says it, that it didn't do that, but that's what happened afterwards. We came to a place of satisfaction. We came to a place, we had a conversation in four years, we came to a place of arrival. Friend, just because you were born as a little baby one day, when you were born as a little baby one day, there was no denying that your life began. Friend, that was not the culmination of your life. It was only intended to be the beginning. What mother, what sound-minded mother would say, I'm satisfied for the birth of my child and have no regard for anything else? No, it is about the life of the child. At what birthday... Does my child finally get to that I say, I no longer care about his life. He's arrived at what my goals were. When does that happen? 
Has that happened for anybody? Does that ever happen? God forbid. God forbid. Why is it that these questions are never asked? Have you ever heard a minister from any church on this planet that's ever asked you that question before? I've never. Why is that not asked? Why is that not considered? I, 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 I don't know. I'm not taking credit. I never asked it before either. I considered the question about 8 o'clock this morning. I got the better word usage at about 10.55 this morning. But when we sought Christ for salvation and we sought Christ for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there was an intensity of dependency and an equal intensity of eagerness that honestly we've never had again. This is what Paul meant in Colossians 2.6 when he says, in the same way you came to him, remain in him. You see, he's talking about the same Intensity of dependency and eagerness that you came to him. Never lose it. Remain rooted and established in faith, which is dependency. It's assured, assuredness in your dependency. Certainty, that of which I do not see, will manifest, which is the glory of God. I wrote that the initial baptism in the Holy Spirit was not the event. But it's intended to be the first event of many evidences. And I'm using that word clearly. Many evidences of the life of Christ. Never take, never take a detail of Christ and make that the evidence of Christ. Because you'll find yourself settling for that detail and you'll miss the fullness of Christ. As Ephesians 4 says, is the maturity of the church. When it comes into unity of the faith, which is a dependency mindset, reaching the fullness of Christ, not a detail. Every detail of Christ is excellent. Every detail of Christ is is wonderful. But the life of Christ is complete. Now, we can go all around this room and talk about Decades ago, when you were potentially, maybe, maybe you have a story, a testimony where you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And every one of them is completely legitimate. And every one of them was from God. And every one of them was wonderful. But every one of them was like a little baby being born. It was not the event. It was the first event. It was never intended to be desired less now that you had the first event. If anything, the second event, there should be a greater intensity of dependency and a greater intensity of eagerness because now you have the Holy Spirit who produces this fully engaged. But why did it become less? It could only be because we did not remain in the position that we were in when we came to him. Could it be that the more we thought we understood about Christ, 
the more we begin to lean on our understanding about Christ. And the more church leadership, which I'm involved with, began to pat us on the back and commend us for maturing and growing, the more we thought we were maturing and growing and we became dependent on our maturity and our growth and less on Christ and our dependency and our eagerness that we had when we came to him decreased. And that is not what John the Baptist meant when he said, I must decrease and he must increase. Oh, no, 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 no. John the Baptist was decreasing his dependency in his great, big, thriving, by the way, ministry. Huge ministry. Thank God there were not TV cameras. Thank God they didn't come and mess everything up. And put all the attention on the wrong things. And then find a way to support it. That's a, I'm not, I'm not, that's, that, that was, I, I think that was probably flesh saying that. But I'll admit it, there's some frustration there because I, I, I see the dangers of what is called Christ and people's dependency become on something, to, become on a detail rather than the, the life of Christ. So, I, I just want to make it clear that I'm not arguing against your encounter, call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I am for that. This ministry is for that. What we're not for is settling for a birth and not hoping for a life. We're not settling for a one-time event. Rejoice in every difficulty in my body right now. I rejoice because I never had to depend on Christ like I have to right now. Maybe that's why he's just having his way. Boy, he's having his way too. Someone came to your house and, man, y'all began to sing some songs and get into the scripture and talk about the Lord. And, man, he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Nobody will rejoice more than I will. Understand that. And I'm going to say something that I don't really mean. It's hyperbole. But if that was the last experience he had of Christ, I'd rather that not happen. Now, I really wouldn't rather that not happen before I had to answer a bunch of calls later today and emails and text messages. I don't really not want that to happen because I know that is excellent. But do you understand my point that I'm making? I speak hyper, hy hyperbolic in a sense or with extremisms on that in order to stress what I'm trying to say. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about four men that were at three separate events. One of them was at all the events, Jesus. Two of them are going to represent the twelve. And they were in the three. They, they, they were in the inner circle of Jesus three. That's Peter and John. We're going to use Peter and John to represent the twelve. I don't know enough about Thomas and Bartholomew to talk about all of them. But we'll use two because they wrote in the text. They wrote in the scriptures, those two men. And I don't have a ton of time, but I want to take a little bit of it to... Look at 
what all four of these men said. And another one was Paul, who was at a different event. James and John, and it should be understood that Jesus was at all the events, but James and uh, John and Peter, I, I, I mean, were at the Acts 2 baptism of the Holy Spirit event that was prophesied by Joel. This is that. Spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that. That on the day of Pentecost. Remember that song? This is that. God's pouring out today. It's so fine. It's so fine. God's new wine. They were at that event. You remember that song, Craig? You don't remember it, huh? Yeah, you do. Okay, good. Thanks. Just tell me yeah. <clears throat> Paul was at another event where he found himself lying on the ground blind. And he has, he goes on Straight Street <clears throat> to a man's house where Ananias comes and lays hands on him, and his eyesight is restored, and it says this, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's a sepsis of city. That, that's a real event. Peter and John were at a real event. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So was Paul. And we see another real event where Jesus is being water baptized. And we see, and I don't, I don't fully understand this part. So don't ask me questions. I'll divert you to Pastor Terrell for these questions. And Pastor Diaz. But a dove descends on him. And we know he was filled with the Spirit. Barry's favorite scripture. That Jesus, it's in a different place. But Jesus was filled with the Spirit beyond measure, without limit, without limit, limitless, no limitation. So we'll say there's three different, I don't understand Jesus's. But there were three different events where it was clear that these men were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know Jesus was the greatest. He, he is the Messiah. He is the only Messiah. Let me, let me go ahead and clear the air on this. Never, just for, so you know, never do we proclaim that we will attain to his status. No, what we are proclaiming is that we are exactly opposite of his status. We're total flesh that deserved to become dust again. And therefore, we need not to be, try to be like him, but we need him to represent himself fully as he's capable of through us. Amen. That's what we're preaching. We are preaching, no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Now, I said that in King James. I don't know how, his sons, how King James' son said it. That's the new King James, right? His son wrote that one. I'm just having fun, boy. God, he speaks through all these Bible versions. Just pick your favorite one and ask the Lord to show you what he wants to show you. John writes the book of, I call it the winter book, Long John, the Gospel John. Good book to read by the fire. Then he writes 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation. Peter writes 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Jesus speaks all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, speaks a little bit in Acts, speaks a little bit in Corinthians, speaks a little bit in Revelation, right? We see Jesus actually speaking. I'm just talking about the red letters. We see him speaking everywhere. We see him speaking here. But as far as the Bible is concerned, we see him speaking in these books. Paul writes a ton of the New Testament. And in all these writings, I, I, I just, charismatic church, listen to me. In all of these writings, there's very, barely any reflection back at their baptism Holy Spirit moment. Very little. Peter never mentions it in 1 Peter or 2 Peter. 1 John 
doesn't mention anything about Acts 2. Does that take away from it? Absolutely not. It was the birth, man. It was the birth of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in you. But it wasn't what you looked back to. It's what you should be looking forward to. And that's what they're writing about. That's what they're writing about. They're writing about how to position yourself in the faith so that Christ can come alive in you. Jesus, he puts very little emphasis on what the charismatic church puts the emphasis on. Is he for prophecy? Absolutely. Is he for speaking in tongues? Absolutely. He even mentioned it at the end of Mark. But but you could tell the emphasis is not, man, if you can get that, then, man, that's evidence that you're cool with God. You're one of the mature believers now. You're in a class. We look for people like you. No. The emphasis just continues to be on you need the life of Christ. You haven't arrived. Just because you were born one day doesn't mean you know how to live. Just because you were filled with the Holy Spirit one day doesn't mean you know how to lord over it, over him, not it. Doesn't mean you know what you need. Doesn't mean you know how to reproduce that either. The emphasis never goes back to that. It always goes to how to position ourselves for Christ Fully have his way in us. And I don't think everybody understands what, I'm, what, what, what I mean by that. I, I am telling you that in a casual moment of your life, Christ himself, for the one who, listen to me now, for the one who with great intensity depends on him for this and with equal intensity desires him for this. See, there's an intentional looking out for this. For that person, that person will have glorious moments from glorious moments, and that person can't turn it on at all. They're completely under the lordship of the one who can, and they wait for him to at one glorious moment from another, and he's faithful to consistently bring these about. They're waiting on him to resurrect from the low position in them, Christ in us, the hope of glory. From the low position in them, they join him in that low position. And they say, I'm waiting for you to produce. The only thing you can produce. And at a day and hour unexpected, he, the Son of Man, is lifted up. And he lifts himself up. He resurrects himself through a conversation or an action. In a way that in the midst of it, you are clearly aware that it is greater than you. By the way, I think that's a greater baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because what that is, is that's the emptying of self so that he can immerse us, which is the word for baptism, immerse us, overwhelm us, and come out of us. That's what John, Peter, Jesus and Paul constantly talk about. That's what they talk about. They would rejoice with you over your initial baptism with the Holy Spirit, but they would say, let that remind you of what he wants to do in you. Peter spoke in other tongues, remember? They they all spoke in other tongues. But you know what Peter would say is greater than that? And by the way, I speak in tongues every day. I'm not speaking against it. I'm for it. But there's a tongue I want to speak in that is far greater than that. And I, I, I didn't give it to, to, to the screen people, to our, our, our wonderful sisters back there today. I'm going to flip over to it. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4. This is the tongue that I would rather speak in. 
1 Peter 4.11. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. See, this is what it means when it says that we, we could be ambassadors of Christ. And then it goes on to, to, to say, it is as though Christ is making his appeal through us. This is what it means to speak the very words of God. In other words, letting God speak through you. And he doesn't stop there. If anyone serves, oh, here's the actions. He should do it with the strength God provides. Why? Why should I do exactly what Jesus did, by the way, who said, I never speak unless the Father speaks through me? It is the Father who tells me what to say and how to say it. He's talking about spiritual things. He's not talking about... You know, oh, that's a nice house. It's pretty. He, he said those things, you know. But he's saying the, the, the things that are spiritual, I waited on the Father. And then he said things like this. He said, it is the Father who lives and does his work through me. You say, that, that, that's hard to do. That's why we're teaching to depend on him. It's hard to stop. Speaking and doing on behalf of Christ, you cannot do it unless you fully trust that he's going to speak and act through you, and you're going to be very aware that it's him. That's, the, that's a greater baptism. That's the life of Christ. Watch what he says, because I'm sitting there saying, why? Why should I only speak the words of Christ? Why should I only serve with the strength that God provides? In other words, you're not doing it unless something's given to you, enabling you to do it. Why? Oh, and he answers it. So that, this is why. This is why. You want to know why? This is why. So that in all things God may be praised, not your ministry. So market that. Put a copyright on that and sell that. Not your ministry but that God may be praised. In other words, if they're praising the ministry, it's because they believe you, you had the power to do it. But if they praise God, then it's clear to them that God did something that you were not able to do. These are the things God wants us to do. So that God, in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. And he goes on, he double emphasizes it with this. To him, be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That's what Peter said. Peter spoke in tongues. And Pastor Taylor did a great job at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, he showed us. After they spoke in tongues, Peter stands up, same chapter, the end of Acts chapter 2, and he speaks a word that was greater than the word of tongues. Because he spoke a word that was the very word of God that pierced the heart of 3,000 who were added to their number that day. Friend, that was a greater word than a word of tongue. Apostle Paul says, I speak in tongues more than all of you, and I wish all of you spoke in tongues. So it's important. He says you should eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the ones that edify others. And you know what he says in chapter 13? He says, man, you can speak in tongues and prophesy, but if you don't have love, it means nothing, he says. Nothing. What are you doing settling for something that makes you feel more secure because the absence of the life of Christ is present? Remember that quote? Because the, the life of Christ is absent, so we settle on something we can do and call ourselves spirit-filled. It's a hard word, but it's a good word. And I mean good in a way that is better than you think. It's the life of Christ that begins to minimize the things that we thought were primary that becomes very good and very great even, but very secondary. You see, there's a cart in front of the horse oftentimes.
anyone speaks, he should speak as though he's speaking the very words of God. If anyone acts, he should only act and serve based on the strength that God provides him so that God may be praised and receive glory. God. I don't have time to tell you what all Jesus said about this. I, I will not finish. I will never finish. I will never finish. I don't have time to tell you what Paul said about it. But basically, in a nutshell, Paul said, I count all things and consider them loss for the sake of gaining Christ. See, he's saying I take everything that I've been given, even the things given to me by God, and I lose them. In other words, I die, I die to my dependence upon even those things. And I placed him death in the death position for, for a purpose, so he says, for the sake of gaining Christ. See, Christ only resurrects from the dead. He doesn't resurrect from the living. He doesn't. Friend, you've not matured, neither have I. We have not matured beyond our inheritance of Adam. As long as we continue to depend on our inheritance from Adam, which is our abilities, our wisdom, our tendency to try to grab something good about God, for him it was knowledge, and then depend on it. Do you understand? Do you understand who you come from? Do you understand that you come from a man that wanted to grab something good about God like knowledge? And then depend on it. So he wouldn't have to depend on God as much. You understand? That's, who, that, 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 that's our stock. That's who we come from. We want to grab something good about God. So we can depend on it. And less on him. Now he who can't admit this. Will remain blind. But this is what man wants to do. And, 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 and friend, we would never mature past our inheritance from Adam. The greatest thing we can do is say, boy, that's the truth about me. I'm finally aware of it. God, you've always been aware of it. Now I finally agree with you. I acknowledge my sinfulness before you. I acknowledge my Adamness before you. I agree with your word about me. Homo logeo, same word. I, that's the word for acknowledging your sin. I, same word, acknowledge, agree, confess the word the Bible's use. The word is homo logeo. I, same word as you, agree about my sin problem. I come from Adam. I'm not even talking about murder and adultery. I'm talking about my sin problem of not wanting to depend on you. Now I finally agree with you. I acknowledge it. And then the greatest thing is, I also agree with you about your ability. And I'm going to rest in the death position of my dependence on my Adamness. And I'm going to wait and depend on your ability to bring the Christ-likeness, the very essence of the life of Christ, through that. I feel like I need to read this one verse out of 1 John 2, 8. He says, because I hadn't told you what John thought about it, but I'll just sum it up in this. He says, in verse 7, dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. See, everything you heard about God was right. It's correct. Everything that happened was right. It was correct. But watch this. Yet I am writing you a new command. 
Everything you heard about God was good. It was right. But there is something even more adequate. Everything that happened to John in Acts chapter 2 was of God and it was good. He experienced the life of the Holy Spirit. Say the birth of the Holy Spirit. The initial indwelling in, in, in and in baptism even of the Holy Spirit. The birth of the baptism. But now he's saying, that's old command, but now there's a new command. You know what? There's a life of the Holy Spirit. We're going to draw our attention not to the old, but to the, what's new, what's ahead. What's ahead. We're drawing our attention to what's ahead. Not about what happened. That was great. Who walks around telling everybody about the day they were born at Woman's Hospital in Baton Rouge? Like, nobody even knows that about me. I weighed 7 Eleven, by the way. There was a store called that. Nobody knows that about me. Why? I don't go around talking about my first birth. I don't go around talking about that day. I wouldn't have what I have today if it wasn't for that day, but nobody cares. They want to see what's happening in your life today. Friend, nobody in the world cares about the day we got born again unless they see the life of Christ in us. They don't care. Quit trying, Pastor, quit trying to cram salvation into everybody's hearts when they don't care unless they see the life of Christ in you. If they think the life of Christ is not worth living for, why would they want to be born again? The greatest thing we can do is let Christ live through us. John says the new command is this. He don't even tell you what it is. You know why? Because he doesn't know what it is. David was not a scholar. I'm not changing the subject. David was not a scholar. David was not an elder in that sense. And David said, he said, Lord, I know your commands and your precepts better than the teacher's and the elders of Israel. David couldn't quote the scripture as well as they could. It wasn't what he was talking about. You see, the commands of God are discovered along the way. His very command, detailed command on your life, that of which he ordered before time began, the details that he wants to produce through your life are the greatest commands that we have no clue what they are. They're new. And they only happen as the life of Christ happens to us. They only happen as we trust him and depend on him to produce his life. We find ourselves in the midst of the obedience to those commands. He says, Yet I'm writing you a new command. He don't know what the command is, but he knows how to recognize the fulfillment of it. He says, Its truth is seen. In him. That means when you're abiding in him, only then is the truth of these commands seen. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing in the tr- flesh. Your flesh is passing when you're in this position. And the true light is already shining. Let let him shine. I'm not even going to try to close this service. I, I cannot do it. I'm not going to wrap a nice, pretty bow on it because I can't do it. And I don't have the authority to do it. I speak to you what I believe to be the words of Christ with sprinklings probably of the words of Jason in there. And I hope those pass more and more so that his can shine more and more. So I don't know how to close it other than the altars are open. We're not settling for a past event. We rejoice in it. 
If you know the date of it, celebrate it like a birthday every year. Great. But let's celebrate what should be springing from that. The life of Christ. May he produce his life, his words, his, his deeds, his emotion, his life from glory to glory in and through us. So we're going to just open the altars. We're going to pray. We're going to dismiss. And feel free to come to the altars for an hour if you need to, whatever. We're not going to change the, the lighting. It's going to stay like it is. The music will stay like it is, and you just spend time with the Lord if you need. The rest of us will dismiss quietly to the, to the four year Lord, I just ask you to produce your life in us. I pray that every baptism of the Holy Spirit moment would be seen more regularly. The result of that birthing Lord, may the world see the life that should be springing forth from that. Teach us to admit that we never mature past Adam. We are what we are. So therefore, our dependency on you should remain as great as it ever was before. Because unless you produce Christ in us, we can't do it, and you're not disappointed about that. You've always known that. What disappoints you is when we deny that about ourselves and refuse to come into agreement with you about that sinfulness that we are. So, Lord, our dependency and our eagerness ought to be intensified today because we need you to produce your life, your character in us because we cannot do it. You do not expect us to do it. What great news. And you will do it for those who believe on you. For they will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. Oh, Lord, you love the world. You love the world, Lord. You love the world so much that you gave your, your only son. That those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That those who rightfully believe on you will experience the everlasting life in this life. The everlasting life of Christ in this life so that the world may see his glory and that the world that Christ loves so much would see his glory because his church lets his life, his everlasting life shine before them. Amen, we pray.